Hi, everybody. Today we're going to talk about still lifes, um, what they are, um, why they're cool, and how you can set up your own. I'm going to share with you this amazing site um, called the Google Arts Project that I recommend you check out whenever you want. Um, it allows you to take virtual museum tours and also to look at paintings who well, actually art of all kinds um, in museums that are around the world. Very, very cool. Um, I'm going to use it right here just to um, start talking about still lifes. I've got a, a small collection of them that I picked out and I want you to think to yourself, what do these all have in common? And there's several similarities, but this one kind of being the odd one out, what we see is that all of them are, these particular ones are paintings. A still life could definitely be a photograph or um, a sculpture. But in this case, these are all paintings in color that have subject matter of inanimate objects. Some of it's natural, some of it's man-made, um, but there's no figures in them. Um, there's, you know, no people or, um, it's not really about the space or the place or the action of, you know, something going on like a history painting. Um, it's very much these still objects. It's a whole genre um, and there's a long tradition of it. Um, and I just want to show you a few of these because it's so nice to be able to see them in person and when I go to a museum I like to get really really close to things um, which sometimes gets me in trouble with the docent but what this what I like about this site is you can double click and zoom in and get really close up and really see the brush strokes of these artists and what's so cool is that, you know, when you're looking at things from a distance, they appear a certain way in terms of like really defined edges and it might look really smooth and it, it might all blend in to appear to be sort of one shade, but then you get close up and you can see the subtleties of actually where the paint is applied, how the direction of the stroke, how there's a lot of different colors going on in here. And I think it's worth looking at that, especially for beginning painters, in thinking about how when we represent objects or people or anything um, that we're representing visually, it's really just shape and shadow. And in this case, brushstroke comes into play too. So I'm gonna back out of this one. This particular Pink Roses Chinese vase piece by Samuel Peplo. Let's go over to Gauguin's chair, painted by Vincent van Gogh, late 1800s. Now, if you're familiar with van Gogh, he's known for a particular style of brushwork, right? A lot of times, Kind of what he's done with this texture in the background is pretty characteristic. He's sort of working with outlines in this case, which of course we know isn't necessary. We can just use value, but that's the style that he's working with. Really nice thick application of paint and there's so many different colors in here. Quite nice. This is what I would refer to as complex color, where you could look at this book and you could say, ah, that's a yellow book, but then you zoom into it. And there's like some browns, some greens, he's even got a little bit of purples. You know, there's a lot going on there color wise. Back out. William Merritt Chase. 
this is not the exact painting that we have at the St. Louis Art Museum, um, but there's another one by this artist that's just fantastic. And here's, here's a, an example of one that looks so smooth, so distinct in its shape, you know, looks like it's almost like photorealistic from a distance. And then you zoom in and you have the pleasure of seeing these strokes up close and personal. And how he creates that reflection of light with just these little spots of kind of this light yellow. So nice. Okay. So feel free to visit this site and just admire as much as you please. Um, it's a great site. You can type in different search words um, when you come home and <clears throat> come to the home of it, or, or rather explore, let's say. And it also has all kinds of like pre-made galleries for you to check out too. Really fun. Okay, so let me go over here now. And I want to talk about you setting up your own still life. So as you're doing this and you're picking out objects, pick out two, three, or four objects. Um, just something that you find easily in your home. I recommend not choosing something perishable because you're going to work on it for, you know, over a number of days. So if you have like a beautiful tulip in your yard, that's great for like a one day study, but it's going to potentially wilt and change as you paint. So try and choose something that's going to keep its shape. Um, when you're choosing the objects, think about the colors. Do you like how they look together? Do they complement each other? Um, and when you're choosing your space, think about um, what the background looks like. Do you want to put up some construction paper with another color on the wall behind it so that you've got um, you know, just a different color to work into your palette? Or um, do you want to work in a corner? Do you want to work... Um, what else could I say? Oh, about light, you know, thinking about the light that's going to be um, involved to changes the color palette. I want you to overlap those objects so that you have depth. I want you to use um, a viewfinder to help you crop in. Also, like a, a camera phone can be a, a viewfinder too. Um, and then setting up lighting to create a range of values so that there's um, even more dramatic lights and darks than maybe there would be otherwise. So perhaps that means bringing a lamp in, especially if you think you might be working um, after the sun goes down sometimes, if that's more kind of what your schedule is. But a um, few things to consider as you get started. So just some examples. So when I say use overlapping to create depth, this still life has more, well, has overlapping, where this one, these four objects don't really. It has a little more interest to me, I have to say, um, and has more depth as well. Cropping. So, um, the cropping is up to you. I want to encourage you to minimize some of your negative space and zoom into your objects, like go big or go home. Um, for example, you know, this, this is a nice balance to life, but it's, I think, even more interesting if we zoom in more so that you can um, have more fun with all the colors in these objects if this were your still life, for example. So see how the Yes, that's an apple. The apple in this case is spilling off the side and the bowl is spilling off the side and the shadow of this pear is too and the shadow of the bowl. Um, that's a really nice composition. That is balanced and dynamic. Um, adds a little bit of interest. So the rule of thirds 
is, I mean, rules in art, right? But it's a, it's a useful sort of compositional construct to consider when you're figuring out what your object, like kind of how your objects are going to fall in your frame. Um, and it just means that if you were to divide your canvas in thirds going across and in thirds going down, and you had some of the more interesting parts of, excuse me, of your arrangement hanging out around where the lines intersect, it makes for an interesting composition. Versus having something just smack right in the middle, a little bit boring. Um, it can, can certainly be done well, but think, consider using the rule of thirds to kind of add some tension and interest to your arrangement. So here's an example of a Paul Cezanne work where it's objects. Yes, of course, they're in the center too, but they're also hitting these third line points. So if you choose something shiny or reflective, um, that's going to be a really cool challenge because, of course, it has this sort of mirror effect where I think this might be like a slice of acorn squash, perhaps, or a pumpkin. Um, it's being reflected inside the shiny tea kettle here. Um, notice that this is a silver tea kettle but there is so much interesting color going on in here. Um, and especially, especially if you're working with something that's reflective like this, you would never, well, you would learn about it as, as you look at the objects over time. But what I would want you to avoid is simply looking at this kettle saying, ah, it's silver creating gray and then filling in the shape of the kettle without really, really, really looking at what the colors are actually in on, on the surface of that kettle. So, you know, there's like, there's beige, there's brown, there's purple, there's yellow, there's, um, what else is going on in there? All kinds of beautiful neutrals, there's blues, Greens, a lot going on in there. Anyway, reflections are a challenge if you want to try that. And if this is your very first time painting, maybe you don't want to try that yet. Another cool one with reflections. Again, where the silver is clearly lots of different colors. Um, I also like this image because the artist has kind of broken up the background space by putting these either napkins or pieces of paper down that just kind of make it a little more interesting in the background. Another reflection, kind of a different style of applying paint too, but again, lots of other colors involved in anywhere that there is a reflection. Here's some examples of some student works from this project over the last several years. Really lovely. Overlapping to create depth. Has, well, she has more than two to four objects here. She's put down something underneath so that she has a contrast between the ground and the wall back here. Use of reflections, cool textures. I love this one. I love this one for the way that she's applied the paint in a pretty gestural fashion with these strokes um, that are sort of echoing the shape or the, or the form rather, the three-dimensional shape of all these objects. And she chose something, this glass cylinder here that had objects on the inside. Um, that's another thing that's a challenge to do if this is maybe your very first time doing a painting like this. Maybe you avoid glass for now. Um, but what I want to point out is that she's simply created 
this stroke right here of a reflection and this kind of highlight information down at the bottom and along the side and it tells us oh that's a glass cylinder otherwise we might not recognize that simple stacking of books and a candle vase um, with some flowers sort of cascading over the edge really nice overlapping there if you choose things like books or things that um, are rectangular, of course, you'll want to think about um, perspective in this case and how the edges, as they, excuse me, go off into space, eventually, eventually would intersect as opposed to going in opposite directions. Sort of picnic story at play here. Another kind of interesting one with perspective in the checkered cloth. Nice, nice, nice example of really zooming in and cropping close so that there's a, a close focus on just a few objects and she can really work on the texture and the color. Another nice example of the use of value, lights and darks kind of all over the piece. Okay, so your task now is to choose some objects, set them up, um, and see how you like them. Check in with me, you'll take a picture of them, send it in, and I'll give you any feedback if there's some things that I think would help you. Have a nice day.